Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Welcome to this workshop organized within the framework of the Cairo Climate Talks. On behalf of the organizers, the delegation of the European Union to the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Cairo Climate Talks and the French Institute, I would like to thank you for your attendance. Today we will have the opportunity to discuss thoroughly a technical aspect of climate change negotiations in the topic of climate finance. The choice to discuss this topic comes in the run-up to COP21, which is to be held in Paris between the 30th of November and the 11th of December this year. One of the key points of the Paris negotiations will be to ensure compliance with the commitments made in Copenhagen in 2009 regarding funding for countries at the South, which amount to $100 billion per year of public and private funding from 2020 onwards. Reviewing issues around climate finance today also comes in the wake of the 30th Cairo Climate Talk, which took place in April this year, and was entitled Two Degrees Paris Negotiations for an Urgent Health to Global Warming. During this workshop, followed by a public panel, we covered several key issues related to these negotiations, including the challenge and the emergency, the ways to maximize the chances for a fruitful agreement and to avoid dissolutions of past negotiations, the specific role of the EU and the expectations of countries from the global north and the global south, including Egypt and the countries it represents. Today's workshop on climate finance will unfold in three parts. We will start by scrutinizing existing mechanisms which can be mobilized to finance a low carbon economy. Climate finance significance, uh, it will be in your agenda, the climate finance significance and availability sessions. We will then get closer from the project level and we will carry on with the review, feedback and lesson learned of both climate mitigation and adaptation projects implemented in Egypt by a wide range of donors. Oh, okay, so we'll do a short um, pause and welcome His Excellency, the Minister of State for Environmental Affairs, Dr. Khaled Fahmi. Welcome, Your Excellency. My turn? <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Okay, so um, in the second part of the um, workshop, we will get closer from the project level and we will carry on um, review, feedback and lesson learns of both climate mitigation and adaptation projects implemented in Egypt by a wide range of donors, including the EU, um, governmental implementing organizations, cooperation and investment banks and United Nations agencies. Finally, we will rise to policy level and tackle Egypt's roadmap towards a low-carbon economy, including update, updating the development of the INDC proposal, the implementation of an Egyptian strategy on climate adaptation and mitigation, the role of the private sector in the development of low-carbon and resilient infrastructures. With this respect, we're very grateful for the participation of several experts in the field of climate finance who will make presentations on these topics, which will be followed by a um, period of discussion. For now, let us start with four welcome notes. I will kindly ask our audience to turn off mobile phones and I would like to welcome the ambassadors and ministry speeches. Um, I'm very honored to ask His Excellency James Moran Ambassador and Head of the EU Delegation to give us his welcoming speech. Thank you, thank you very much and uh, good morning, Sabal here, Atom Vassalan and uh, especially to the Minister and of course to my colleague uh, ambassadors from France and from Germany. Um, as was said, uh, we're in a very important moment uh, right now in the run-up to this extraordinarily uh, significant uh, global climate conference in Paris uh, in December. Uh, and on that, the European Union was the first major entity to give its contribution uh, to this new agreement, and many other countries have since followed. Uh, of course, all countries are expected to come forward 
uh, with contributions uh, so that we can have all of us a robust and a dynamic uh, deal that is fit for present and for future purpose. And you know, of course, um, especially with an audience like this, that the overriding aim, aim is to keep global temperatures rises to below two degrees Celsius. I know Egypt's been working hard on all of this too, and we're looking forward to hearing um, uh, from uh, Egypt uh, as well uh, in terms of its own contribution. I'm sure that will come very soon. That objective of two degrees uh, will require very significant financial resources so as to deal with uh, climate change, both to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to adapt to the consequences of climate change. And uh, just to tell you, the EU has long been the world's leading provider of climate finance through official development assistance, and climate issues are fully integrated into all of our development strategies. For more than a decade, uh, we've steadily increased that finance for developing countries by using traditional grant funding uh, alone and more, than, more, more often than not to leverage additional commitments from the private sector and loans from European financial institutions. Um, climate change objectives are fully integrated into the EU budget for the next six years and um, we have an ambitious series of measures and targets. Uh, that includes uh, an overarching target that at least 20 percent, that's 20 percent of the overall EU budget will be spent on climate related activities. Uh, and that means that uh, when it comes to working with our partners, an estimated 14 billion euros of grants from uh, this year up to 2020 will go towards climate spending in the developing world. And that's on top of climate uh, finance from individual member states like France, like Germany, who have their own bilateral programs. So the effort is, uh, is, is significant. But it's clear that um, the Paris uh, deal, when it comes, must also uh, deliver more than simply reducing emissions. The financing of mitigation measures will not mean anything if there's no will to implement the decisions that are needed to change unsustainable ways of living. And here, we must be ready to support those who are most vulnerable to climate change and who lack the means to cope with its negative consequences. And we need to push forward international cooperation for adaptation. Uh, this includes many measures which are relevant right here in Egypt, such as using scarce uh, water resources more efficiently, adapting building codes, planning and developing appropriate infrastructure to contain floods. Uh, we have an example, perhaps, of extreme weather this week, this very week in Alexandria, where many, many people have suffered, uh, especially uh, poorer people uh, on the north coast, uh, from the, t the terrible weather that we saw two or three days ago. This is one of a whole series of extreme weather events that affect all of us, all around the world, uh, increasingly. We need to develop drought-tolerant crops and set aside land corridors to help species migrate. Many other measures have to be done. Now, some is already being done on the ground. Right here in Egypt, uh, adaptation to and mitigation of climate change are important priorities for our assistance programs. Over 770 million euros of the ongoing European Union grant assistance here in Egypt is climate relevant. And a part of this has helped to leverage additional loans from the European Investment Bank and other EU development banks, especially those uh, from France, from Germany, and from uh, other places. Um, and these projects work in areas such as renewable and clean energy, energy efficiency, transport, sanitation, water, waste management, pollution abatement, housing, agriculture, right across the board. Indeed, together with the, um, uh, your colleague minister, uh, next week we'll be inaugurating the latest of these key investments, the new wind farms in El Zayt. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure uh, my French ambassador colleague will tell us more about Paris which is one of the most important international events of this century so far. Uh, to repeat, the European Union is fully committed to, to doing its part, but a successful outcome depends on continued cooperation and collaboration with our key partners, uh, of which, of course, Egypt is a major entity. Uh, climate financing is uh, the focus today, and this gives us an opportunity to review uh, what's being done, what should be done, and what might be done for the future. And I see we've got a pretty good turnout. I wish you a very good and fruitful day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And now it's a great honor for me to ask His Excellency Julius Georg Loy, 
ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany, to give us his welcoming note. Uh, thank you, and uh, Mr. Minister, ambassadors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear guests, nature will talk to us. It was some time ago the climate expert Jans Joachim Schellenhuber's prediction on the effects uh, of climate change. Taking into account the visible and sensible consequences of global warming and the cataclysms increasing in quantity and intensity worldwide, I dare to update him, uh, saying nature is already yelling at us. Climate change has become a crucial challenge in international politics, endangering peace and stability. It is no longer limited to the sphere of environmentalists, but turned into a highly political issue. Scarce resources, a reduction of arable land, uninhabitable areas and fewer sources of income might destabilize states as well as cross-border regions and cause migration streams as well as tensions between neighboring states. Thus, preventive security policy needs to take into account climate change. The essential objective of the upcoming Paris negotiations is to limit global warming to a maximum of two additional degrees Celsius. And this is a very, very ambitious uh, goal, uh, as we know. Some even doubt uh, it's still attainable. The impact of a potential failure of the international community to reach such an agreement would be severe, yet unevenly distributed. Egypt will be among the countries most severely hit by climate change and global warming. Rising sea levels, desertification and water scarcity are only some of the consequences induced by an increase in average temperature. At the same time, Egypt plays a crucial role during the negotiations, being the leader of the Arab group of states and the country hosting this year's Africa Ministerial Conference on the Environment. When it comes to initial investments aiming at limiting emissions, states are not in an equal financial position. This is where climate finance and the Greek Climate Fund specifically come into play. These investments will eventually pay off. They will pay off on a global level if the community of states manages in a common effort to halt global warming. They will also pay off on a national level. Based on our experience in Germany, the energy vendor, energy vendor, the energy transition in Germany, we have learned that economic progress and climate-friendly investments go hand in hand, that they are mutually reinforcing each other. It is high time to join our forces. We need both adaptation and mitigation measures in Egypt, technology transfer and advice from experts. But we also need to take into account and develop further what we already have achieved in Egypt. On the ground, an impressive number of climate relevant programs, for example, of German Development Corporation are underway. Let me just give three examples out of many. In the energy sector, one of our focal areas of cooperation in Egypt, Germany has financed the Zafarana wind farm, which became operational in 2008. And I will have the pleasure of formally opening, uh, together with the ambassador of the European Union uh, delegation, the Gulf of El Zayed wind farm shortly, next week. Both are investments of hundreds of millions of euros. They will support Egypt in making use of its enormous potential and renewable energy. In the area of irrigation, we are working closely with the government and with farmers in reducing climate-induced water stress by making more efficient use of available water resources. And on the regional level, we support interstate dialogue and access to international financial mechanisms in the area. In today's afternoon session, the head of German Development Cooperation here in Egypt, Sebastian Lesch, will go into more detail on these projects. We are now at the crossroads. On the verge of the Paris negotiations, all states are called upon to publish their nationally determined contributions to the agreement. It requires a strategy 
for developing complementary projects in the future and international financial means to implement those. This forum is another opportunity to discuss the important topic of climate finance, to bring together demand and supply side for climate relevant projects, to engage in a stock taking exercise of what is already there, and most importantly, to develop ideas for a strategy to combat the adverse effects of climate change in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you and us a fruitful workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador. <coughs> and now it's a great pleasure to welcome the Ambassador of France, His Excellency André Parent. Thank you. Excellency Mr. Khalid Fami, uh, Minister of Environment, dear ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Uh, first, it is a pleasure to attend uh, the opening of this workshop, which we are very happy to organize with the delegation of the uh, European Union and the German Embassy. After the meetings that took place in Bonn last week and in Lima the week before, we have uh, entered into the last stage of the pre-COP21 negotiations on climate change. In a little more than a month now, on the 30th of November, heads of states from all over the world will gather in Paris to launch the conference and will, that's a hope, give uh, to their negotiators a necessary impetus for the conclusion of the global, ambitious and binding agreement that we are all looking for. Uh, as we are all aware, uh, climate fin finance will be a key factor for the success of the uh, Paris conference. Our friends and partners from the G77 have uh, repeatedly voiced their concerns about this uh, issue and as a future presidency of the COP21, we have been conducting a strengthened dialogue with them. As a result of these uh, consultations, we decided to organize with our Peruvian friends a conference on climate finance in Lima on the 9th of October. Uh, several conclusions emerged from this conference. First, uh, the first conclusion is that we should and we must be able to collect the $100 billion pledged for the uh, developing countries by 2020. We have uh, reached so far $60 billion, one third thanks to private funding, uh, two thirds thanks to public funding. It is uh, not bad, but it's, it is still far from the goal. So when this is a second uh, conclusion, we need to continue our efforts to, to reach indeed the amount of uh, $100 billion. Uh, dollars. We expect develop, Development Bank to do more. They should unveil uh, additional commitments by the 30th of uh, November. Uh, developed countries uh, must also keep taking responsibility. As uh, uh, a result of, of that, Germany already announced uh, that it will increase its uh, funding and President Hollande on the French side announced in New York last September that France will increase its climate funding from 3 billion euro to 5 in 2020. The third element that came uh, out from Lima is that uh, climate finance in support for adaptation measures in uh, uh, vulner vulnerable countries is not satisfying yet. This is uh, why France has been upholding the idea of, a, of political parity between adaptation and mitigation. We feel that uh, that is a necessary step towards more solidarity between uh, nations. The outcome of the Lima conference was uh, then submitted to the negotiators during the last meeting before Paris that was held last week in Bonn, Germany. As uh, some of you may have heard, the discussions in, in Bonn were tough, but altogether our assessment is that the meeting was fruitful. The first draft agreement that was distributed amongst the, the delegations was uh, heavily, cri uh, heavily criticized by the uh, G77. Some felt that it was not balanced uh, uh, and did not take sufficiently into account the needs and concerns of uh, the uh, developing countries. Others claimed that it uh, lacked the necessary ambition. Therefore, a new draft uh, was issued at the end of the meeting. This uh, new draft, this text, which con will constitute the basis for the negotiation in Paris, is uh, still quite long, 34 pages, instead of the 15 pages we need for an agreement, but still not as long as the hundreds of pages that formed the draft 
uh, before the Copenhagen uh, conference a few, a few years ago. It has a lot of paragraphs between, uh, paragraphs between brackets, which means that a lot uh, of work still has to be, uh, to be done to draw uh, closer uh, together on topics such as, uh, for example, differentiation or, uh, or uh, climate finance. But still no one rejected it, and it is uh, generally considered by the uh, negotiators and certainly by us uh, as a good basis for the resumption of the uh, negotiations in Paris. Much uh, will now depend on what will be achieved during the last weeks. As I said before, there will be no new uh, negotiation se session before Paris, and no new text will be uh, presented until then. But that doesn't, does not mean, of course, that we have nothing to do. On the contrary, the next weeks will be uh, crucial, and a lot of consultations will be held in order to uh, bridge the gaps that still exist on many uh, issues and prepare for the compromises that are necessary to improve the existing draft and put the, negotiate, the negotiators, when they convene again in Paris, in the best possible position to uh, reach an agreement. Uh, let me take the opportunity of Minister Fahmi's presence to uh, say that we are very thankful for the dialogue and cooperation that we have had uh, with Egypt and with him especially on all issues related to the preparation of the COP21 so far. And uh, knowing how much Egypt is committed to the success of uh, this conference, we have no doubt that uh, this dialogue and cooperation will continue during the next weeks and all the way uh, along to the, uh, to the Paris conference. Uh, Minister Fahmi will, I, I don't think it's a secret, will go to Paris on the pre-COP meeting. Uh, that is to say an informal ministerial meeting on the 8th, 8, 8, 9 uh, and, and 10 of November, uh, where minister will not reneg re renegotiate the text but explore possible uh, uh, compromises and prepare for the political impulse that alone will guarantee for the success of the uh, Paris conference. And uh, President Sisi, of course, is invited to attend the opening meeting of the uh, COP21 on the 30th of uh, November. Uh, we need Egypt, which is both the uh, Conference of African Ministers of Environment, AMSEN, and the Committee of African Heads of State on Climate Change, the CAHOSC, and thus plays a, a, crucial, a crucial role uh, on, in Africa on these issues. Climate finance needs to address concrete uh, projects as soon as possible. We hope, for instance, that Africa will soon unveil an ambitious initiative for uh, renewable energies. We understand as well that African partners are working on an adaptation initiative, so we are looking forward for, uh, to hearing more about it as soon as, uh, as possible. I don't want to be uh, longer. I wish uh, you a pleasant day and a fr fruitful workshop. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And now it's a great honor for me to ask the Egyptian Minister of Environment, His Excellency Dr. Khaled Fahmi, for his welcoming note. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Excellency Ambassadors. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for a continued cooperation in the field of environment, in the field of climate change. We look forward for more cooperation and more uh, exchange of expertise, knowledge, technology, maybe funds. Because we look forward for that. Thank you very much. Okay, let me, let me uh, I don't want to go into um, issues that have been raised before, but uh, we are gathered today to discuss a very important and crucial issue, the financing. Let me say it's all about financing. I mean, climate change talks is not an environmental talks. It is an economic political talk. I don't know why I'm a minister of environment going there. Anyway, but it's my duty. So we are addressing an economic political problem. I do agree with His Excellency, the Ambassador of Germany, when he says nature is yelling at us. But it is yelling at us with different messages. For us, the developed countries, the most vulnerable, Africa is the most vulnerable continent, although it produces only 4% of the green gas emission, but we are the most vulnerable. We are the most poor because half of us 
half of our population lives under one dollar and a quarter a day. And at the same time, our economies depends on nature. And the essence and the basis of our economic development is endangered by the climate change. It is not only that we have to grow at a 7% annual growth rate, but this economic growth has to be inclusive according to the Sustainable Development Goals, and it has to be climate-proof. And we are faced with this challenge. How can, we, how can we face this challenge? How can we assure that our people get more, get the rewrites in the terms of the world today? How, how we can assure this, and then at the same time spend on mitigation? Nature is yelling at us, go fight for your rights. Go implement the polluter prey principles. This is what we have been taught and taught by the developing world. I have studied in Germany. I was, I was taught that I should base my uh, 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 policies, environmental policy, on the polluter pay principle. I want to continue with this, and I want to implement it. Who pays? The poor? We know that the developed world is not in, in its best. Their economies are not in best shape. We know that the China economy has problems. A very secretive economy, but it has the problems that's happening there will impact the whole world. We know we are not in the best time for negotiations on funding. Yes, but we have to address it. So, sir and ma'am, we, Egypt, the, G, the group of the 77 in China, the, the Africans, we are not going to Paris to rewrite the convention. We are going to Paris to activate and operationalize the convention. So we will stick hard to the basic principles of the convention. If we translate this to funding, we're, we have a re a reached progress that finally nobody, everybody is now speaking about adaptation and mitigation. This has changed from uh, a couple of months before when we were only speaking about mitigation. But the problem is that we don't see this reflected in decisions. We hear good talks, but we don't see it implementing in decisions. The bond text. A text that came from, I don't know from where, I mean, it, it just, you know, it just things that we, that was never, discussed before and it just you just drop them down and that's it we're not going to agree on this and we're going to fight for that okay there are principles there are things that we discussed over a long time and until now we don't see it reflected in the text we see new things introduced in the text Human rights and adaptation, what do they have to do with each other? So there are, there are, Yanni, we'll start talking, we'll keep talking, guys, but we have to reach a decision in Paris. We hope, we hope that the uh, pre-COP and all the other negotiations, the informal negotiation before that, will squeeze the list of issues of debate to a limited number of issues so that we can address it in Paris. We hope that, and we, we, I hope that we can reach something in the pre-COP uh, pre meetings. But 
we have, on the other side, good signs. There is a political will that this COP will be a success. And let me assure you that Egypt and AMSEN is going to do its best to secure a success in the COP. There is an understanding that mitigation, adaptation, and the 50 50 uh, balance between adaptation and mitigation. We are very happy to hear about one, the 100 billion by 2020, but we just don't see how it's going to be done. We think that adaptation should be majorly public funding, and we do agree that the mitigation should be a mix of public, private, whereby the private share is more, of course, because there is a room for the private sector to, uh, uh, to, uh, to contribute there, and it's in the interest uh, of all. We do believe that you cannot separate funding from the transfer of technology and the capacity building. These are three issues that are interlinked, highly interlinked. This is what it's all about. But we do stress that what we are lacking until now is transparency. Is transparency and accordingly trust. What's lacking is really trust and transparency. And what happened in Bonn really doesn't show that we have reached or we have developed our transparency and trust. And this is why we're looking for a modified text that accommodates us all. We live and we share one word. We will work together. But we will work together under fair conditions and principles. That's what we're looking for. And we hope that we will be having a better word and drawing a better picture of a word, of a future word for our sons and our grandchildren. Uh, we are faced with a very critical moment of time. I think personally that Paris is not the end. And I think that Marrakesh will be another thing. There are things that will be uh, agreed upon in Paris. But the details will then be postponed to the COP22 in Marrakesh. So the way is still long. But we have to start it rightly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellencies, for your welcoming notes, which are inspiring and reflect the strong momentum to prepare for a successful COP, how financial aspects are the heart of both economic development and environmental protection, but also that a common understanding still needs to be reached to take consensual measures when nature is yelling at us. So um, now we will do a short pause for a coffee break of about 20 minutes. So until um, about 10.20 or 10.25. And um, after which um, we will um, continue with the workshop sessions. Thank you.